Thank you very much, Dean. Greatly appreciate the perspective. Um, we are going right into our final panel of the day on cybersecurity crisis response and enterprise risk management strategy. Our moderator is Jennifer Archie, who is a leading cybersecurity uh, attorney on, uh, focusing on cybersecurity and data privacy. She has worked with major companies on very significant breaches uh, in terms of incident response and also um, with regard to dealing with um, the FTC and other federal and state regulators. So um, what I'm going to do for the beginning is just start by having um, each panelist can introduce herself. But Jennifer, there you, I, I didn't see you over there. Yeah, so. I'm sorry, thank you. So I was gonna talk very slowly because I thought Jennifer was coming through that door. But here you are, so thank you. I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, I might, is this mic on? This one's on? It should be yeah. on. So I'm happy to moderate from down here with my friends. <laughs> the big entrance. Uh, so, hello everybody. I'm a um, been a uh, partner at Latham and Watkins. I work out of our Washington D.C. office. And um, what we thought we would do to kick off our panel is just sort of take a couple minutes to introduce, um, you know, e e uh, each of us, our current jobs, uh, how we kind of got here, because it's kind of an interesting forum, like a great panel of um, women with a lot of decades of experience in cybersecurity. And uh, you know, maybe kind of a quick observation about something that you'd like to get into more deeply, something from the headlines, really, you know, a, a free for all on that. So to quickly start with myself, I um, worked on Capitol Hill um, for about four years. I went to Cornell for law school, and uh, I came right out of there and went to Latham and Watkins, and that's 30 years ago. I always say I didn't quit, and they didn't fire me, so here I am. <laughs> but. Uh, no, um, and uh, I've been really focused on computer crime and um, cybersecurity and, uh, and, and now increasingly data privacy for probably as long as anybody uh, from the dawn of the internet uh, and Al Gore. So I think I'll just go start with Kylie and, and it just goes right down. And uh, I think I'm we're going to divide our panel into talking about crisis response. What do you do when the event um, has happened and you need to scramble a team in a response and recover? And also a little bit about enterprise risk management. Great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kylie Watson. I am currently the Chief Information Security Officer for Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation, which is a large um, Japanese bank, we operate all over the world. Um, so a couple of times it's already been mentioned today that you don't have to have a background in uh, computer science to be in cybersecurity. So I did a degree in economics um, and Japanese. I grew up in the northwest of Australia in the outback. Um, we have very clo close trading relationships with Japan and I thought that would be a really great um, career for me. Turns out that at the time, um, I was not quite the right gender and not very good at golf, so didn't manage to get the job that I wanted with the trade company, so looked for something else to do. Um, growing up in the outback, you learn to be very resourceful. We were so remote, we had no television uh, reception station, so we had to entertain ourselves. A lot of pulling things apart, trying to put them back together, figuring out how things work. And my poor father had three daughters, and uh, he didn't let that stop him, so he had us working on the cars and building things and breaking things and let us roam wild. Now, if you've heard stories about the Australian outback, snakes, spiders, lots of scary things. I grew up understanding risk really well. <laughs> and uh, I like to say I have a catastrophizer mind, you know? I've, I've throughout my whole life, learnt that bad things are gonna happen all the time, so just be prepared in advance for what those things might be. Turns out that's really good preparation for a career in cybersecurity. Um, and the tinkering with things was a good uh, background for a career in technology. So I ended up getting a job at IBM, uh, trained to be a systems engineer, and then went from there through a various, various different roles in technology, 
all of which kept leading me back to crisis response, incident response, how do we manage that risk, how do we respond to that drama. Um, so that's how I got here. I've been doing that for about 30 years, give or take a bit. Um, never been bored for a single day. Hello everyone, I'm Radhika Bajpai. I'm currently Senior Program Manager at Google, uh, leading their cloud compliance efforts. And this is, I should put in the caveat that this is really an extremely new role for me, less than short of a month. And I come from a financial and technology background, having spent about 18 years in financial domain at major banks like Goldman Sachs and Bank of New York Mellon. Uh, why I am here, I would like to share the story that exactly three years ago, I was sitting right across the table <laughs> attending this session, and this session kind of changed the course of my career direction. And about a year ago, from uh, due to attending this course, I actually joined the NYU MSCRS program. Erin had been a great, Erin and Judy both had been a great supporter and advocates of the program, so I would be happy to share my experiences with all of you post in the reception event as well. From a background perspective, I actually uh, grew up in India. I uh, was completely in the technology domain for about for seven to eight years of my career, and in mostly in the hedge funds industry domain. And post that, I, I kind of moved more towards line one and line two risk management. So enterprise risk management from a cybersecurity perspective is something that's that's deep and core to my heart when it comes to like continuous controls, monitoring, moving towards automation and things like that. So happy to share my thoughts and ideas with you all as well as learn from you all. Hi everyone, I'm Francesca Lejudai and uh, first I'll just say I'm really excited to be here and uh, this is my first time attending this conference uh, and uh, it's I'm heartened to be in a room full of amazing women uh, and others in the field in cybersecurity and privacy. Um, so like Kylie, I didn't grow up in the outback, but I grew up in the Bronx. Um, have a very uh, um, good understanding of risk as well. Um, I, my background is I attended uh, City University of New York School of Law uh, at Queens College, uh, graduated in 2010. Uh, I have uh, a mother who is a compliance officer. Uh, she was in a compliance role um, uh, during the uh, 2008 Great Recession. Um, she's a huge role model of mine, uh, having been pulled out of school after graduating the eighth grade because Albanian women can't be educated, otherwise they won't get married. Um, so she then, uh, after getting married, having two children, living with her mother-in-law, got her uh, GED uh, and then attended NYU. Uh, attending NYU was always a dream of mine um, and following in her footsteps generally uh, led me into the field of compliance and ultimately uh, having graduated the uh, master's uh, program along with uh, Radhika last, uh, sorry, I think it's last year, but it wasn't, it was May. Um, <laughs> Uh, the year's gone by so quickly. Uh, in any event, uh, after graduating uh, CUNY School of Law, I, uh, first job, I, I didn't think it would start this way, but the first job I got was in the compliance field at AIG. Um, and um, they said, oh, well, you're a lawyer, uh, so we're gonna put you in compliance. And uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, my first responsibilities were to implement best practice recommendations from the SEC. Um, and uh, they said, we need someone in the records management field, we need someone in economic sanctions, and you know, we could use you on privacy too. Um, and so, you know, three very different risk areas, um, but uh, all sort of with a focus on uh, risk uh, mitigation, building controls, uh, and building effective programs. Uh, and then after uh, being at AIG, I joined at STAR, uh, which is a cyber uh, insurance writer as well. We do lots of other insurance, but we write uh, cyber liability, liability insurance. So I'm following that act of war exclusion case quite closely uh, because I have, a, I think, invested interests. Uh, in any event, um, I think uh, from my perspective, just being in-house counsel, uh, you know, uh, and uh, constantly, uh, you know, assessing our readiness, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk uh, today, and a uh, key area of focus is just 
uh, tabletop exercises, the importance of having a core uh, team of people. Uh, you know, you can't involve everyone in every single incident. Uh, but really planning, drilling, uh, and staying current on what the key risks uh, an organization faces are. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I would echo how excited I am to be here. I'm lucky. I get to go to a lot of conferences, but to look around and see almost all women that are passionate about cybersecurity is a rarity, so really excited to see all of you here. Um, so my name is Jody Kaut. I'm the Vice President of Cybersecurity at Target. I've been at Target for, gosh, almost 14 years now, um, starting with some of the important stuff. So I have an eight-year-old son, Owen, and I have an 11-year-old daughter, Olivia. They are sort of the center of my world. And so I think I've stayed at Target as long as I have because Target's enabled me to keep them the center of my world as I've progressed through my career. I actually um, have always been in one way, shape, or form in security at Target across security, compliance, and risk. But in those 14 years, I spent most of it part-time until my kids were at an age to go to school and be a little bit more independent, and since then went back full-time, but all the while sort of progressing in those, in those domain areas. Uh, prior to Target, I was at KPMG on the consulting side, actually out of the Manhattan office, and did that for a number of years. Um, I was lucky, or maybe not so lucky, that Sarbanes-Oxley Act was just going into effect when I graduated from college, and so spent a lot of time with a lot of organizations helping them to understand the IT side of Sarbanes-Oxley. And so although I graduated and became a CPA, Sarbanes-Oxley and sort of the IT audit side pulled me into cyber, and I never looked back. Um, in my current role, I'm lucky to work with a lot of really smart people. I have our cyber threat intelligence capability, so really that proactive side, who are the bad guys that have capability to do harm to target. I have our detection engineering team, so writing the rules to detect those bad guys. I've got cyber engineering, where we build all of our own custom tools, so custom security event monitoring solution. The team's very creative. They have 12 patents pending right now for some custom solutions they've built, which is really fun. Uh, incident response, so responding to those alerts that fire from my detection engineering team. I've got incident management, so that's sort of when things really need to escalate and you've got to coordinate a crisis across the enterprise, everything from comms to law and incident response, that team's on point. I have insider threat, uh, data protection, and then I'm lucky that I get an additional gig in product security or application security, which is really fun. It lets me stretch muscles in a different way outside of my core uh, sort of cyber passion. Today, I'm just really excited to learn from all the smart women up here a little bit more about how they look at crisis response. Um, it's something that I've seen our organization rise to its best whenever we're responding to a crisis, and I love to see how other organizations do that. How can I learn from that and continue to bring that back to target? So, um, what a great lineup. Um, <laughs> So the crisis response, you can think, of, you know, first is a readiness phase, right? Simply um, to do some kind of preparation. Then there's the immediate response itself, and then there's, you know, kind of recovering from it. So if we focus first on the readiness um, f phase, who wants to kind of, you know, pipe up about what may seem boring, but what's really important, which is just getting the documentation piece of, you know, having policies and defined procedures um, across functions and clear roles and who's authorized to speak and who's not going to be authorized to speak. So, you know, any, any insights from, um, your, you know, your jobs or, or stories about, you know, kind of getting the, the readiness phase of crisis together? Um, I can chime in from my perspective. Uh, one of the first tasks that I was ever assigned by our EVP was drafting a crisis management plan. Um, and you know, uh, to be frank, I had never worked on something like that. Uh, and so it was uh, an exciting opportunity, <clears throat> but it really forced me to think about, okay, you know, uh, what needs to go into this plan? Um, and I did a ton of research, spoke to a, a, a bunch of different folks at uh, peer companies and others in the industry. <clears throat> And uh, ultimately, uh, the, the structure uh, that some companies adopt uh, is, uh, you know, you have an overarching crisis management plan. You know, what are all of the different pieces um, uh, or, or things that can uh, lead to a crisis? And it's more than, uh, you know, we're focused on cybersecurity today, but it's more than just cybersecurity. There are a lot of other uh, things that can rise to the level of a crisis. Um, and 
Um, having that plan and having it in a, in an accessible format, um, I find is really important. Um, and getting it to the right people in the organization, you know, who are the key stakeholders, and it's from different disciplines, right? It's not just your uh, CISO, although that person is critically important, and others are critically important. Um, and then also, uh, as uh, those of us uh, who have been on the on the end of having to respond to an incident know, um, those incidents can be very time consuming. Um, and because we have the structure uh, that we have, if there is an actual uh, compromise that you need to do legal analysis and assess whether or not you have reporting obligations, it's not an easy exercise. Uh, and because it's time consuming, you might want to consider alternates, um, you know, not just those. So doing it in as much as you can in advance. Right, and, and, and uh, so, so uh, planning in advance, um, doing exercises, and, and more than one exercise, right, and, and with different people in the organization, right, that, that's um, kind of important because you, you have your core team um, and what I mean by alternates is uh, if that person's not available when something goes bump in the night, uh, there needs to be someone else trained uh, that can react and, and fill their shoes. Um, so that, that's and, and, a piece in mind. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Ta and talking with, talking with um, uh, Kylie beforehand, I think we were saying kind of like it's so important obviously to have a written plan, to practice the plan, but then Kylie, I liked how you said you, know, you can have a plan, practice a plan, but you are going to do a process. Tell, tell me what you meant about, you know, m meant about the difference between, you know, like how important it is to write things down in advance, but then what, you know, w what really happens when you're, um, you know, either rehearsing or, you know, doing um, a crisis and it turns more into a process than, a, than looking things up in a plan. You mean Jody? Yes. Do you want me to take that one? Oh, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, I, um, I mean, I, I, I like me looking down. I have looking, looking all say, the way down. Right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, yes, having a plan to start a crisis response program is important, but anybody that's been in a big crisis knows that you're not going to pull out and read a 50-page plan in the middle of a crisis. And so we have evolved our crisis response program beyond that. Yes, do we have a plan as a foundation? Of course. Do we provide that to evidence for our PCI assessors? Of course. Do we pull it out when we're in a crisis? Absolutely not. For us, it's all about simplicity. So like that's our overarching theme of how you do crisis well. It has to be super simple. And there's three elements to it being successful. One, it's process over plan. Have a really simple framework that you use and all the right people know it because you're not going to be, te be dependent on a plan. To help them know what that process is, yes, we have one page that goes up in the war room when we're activated that tells everybody what that process is. The second piece is know who the right people are and know what their roles are. And to complement that, make sure they are well exercised and well trained. So how I would sort of outline the framework of our crisis response um, program at Target is it starts with a severity grid, one through four. Based on the severity of the incident, that activates the cross-functional crisis management teams. That's made up of incident response from a cybersecurity perspective. It's made up of law, it's made up of comms, enterprise risk management, our guest relations team members, and other additional people from IT depending on the nature of the incident. Then once they're activated, they all have a simple checklist. They know exactly what they're accountable for and what they need to go off to do. They're all activated into a central war room, and we don't worry about pretty communication templates. Gosh, if we have to update the CEO, should we say this word or that word? Everything happens on a whiteboard in a central war room, so anybody that comes in knows exactly what's going on. Here's the facts of the incident. Here are the actions that need to, t to happen and who's accountable for them. Here are the decisions that we need from the leadership team, so when the CEO and his direct reports come in, we know exactly what we need them for. And then we have this fourth section when it's a really complicated incident that we label assumptions on the whiteboard. Because anybody that's been through these incidents, you have to make a lot of assumptions as you're responding to drive containment because you have to move quickly. And there's no way you're going to have all of the facts to contain an incident. But if you track those assumptions that drive your decisions, 
over time, you can hopefully take those assumptions and move them to facts or say, you know what, that assumption we made was wrong and we need to go back and revisit that decision. And those like sort of that simple approach is what's worked well for us as we've evolved over the past few years. So, um, so that's one thing, you know, just as a lawyer, I think like what's so important, with, uh, for, you know, in, in getting the, um, you know, minimizing liability and regulatory exposure and all that is that there be this single source of truth, mm -hmm. right? So you're describing whiteboard world, yep. war room as single source of truth and that this is a very human way that you come up with to do that. What are some other ways people have seen where you sort of maintain single source of truth so that some, you know, consumer confidence, regulator confidence, you know, these different domains don't get, um, you know, kind of d reputationally damaged because there's inconsistent reports about facts. Sure, so I would like to add to that what I usually like to call as like step zero, even before you think about a crisis management plan or something like that. The key thing from my experience, what I have seen is a lot of organizations mm -hmm. still struggle with the basic thing of an asset inventory what exactly are my assets that I'm protecting? What exactly, like, where are my crown jewels of the organization? I think that is really the key, and organization should really spend some time in, uh, in kind of defining that. It also helps with a lot of automation having built on top of that asset inventory when it comes to risk management. In addition to asset inventory, I've also seen organizations that have a proper understanding of their data and various data classifications do not scramble at the end when, when really a crisis is happening. So I like to like kind of collate all of this as step zero of the overall crisis management planning because these are really the, the differentiating factors when you see organizations that are, that are dealing with crisis. These are some of the differentiating factors that I've seen in my experience that that helps the organization go a long way, and as Jennifer was mentioning, plays a key role in making sure that everybody, irrespective of who is asking, gets the same story, gets the same truth, because everybody is looking at the golden source of data. Yeah. Uh, one other way of doing it is, is making sure that there's a crisis management leader um, so that that one person, uh, and it works for smaller organizations where everyone kind of knows each other and, and knows the roles, um, but you know, having that one person being the source of communication um, in an incident, uh, and that person then is responsible for coordinating the rest of the parties. Um, one other thing is about the planning, just to address Jody's comment, um, you know, uh, not everyone is going to know your plan uh, as, as good as the person that authored it. Um, and so uh, within an organization, it's important that, you know, uh, you have one person that's sort of keeping everyone on task. And, and uh, it, it helps when the person that authored the plan is, is someone within the core incident response team because they're reminding people, you know, okay, well, you're going to do this and this is your responsibility. Um, so okay. I have something to, to say in? about yeah. plans. So um, uh, I've been through many, many uh, planning scenarios and what I've discovered over the years is the most effective way to write a plan is actually to exercise it first. Um, we, we tried uh, in the early days in a smaller company, you know, uh, we, we had some consulting help, uh, we had some lawyers, we had a lot of uh, you know, input and we had this fantastic plan. I mean, regulators would love it. Completely useless, untrainable, unusable, right? Um, and so what we started doing was very frequent tabletops covering different areas. Um, we, it's very typical that you start with incident response uh, tabletop simulations around something like a cyber incident. So we actually stood up a completely separate group to focus on all of the non-IT aspects of an incident. Who needs to get involved and what do they need to do? Do we have uh, you know, any kind of protection over the data that we are discovering as we go through this process? Where's corporate comms? What's compliance doing? What's legal doing? Do we need to involve our regulators or call the FBI or other things that have nothing to do with technology? And we did that for a really long time. And we didn't write plans down. We did little tabletops with people and said, what are you going to do now? You know, we got our, our um, you know, chief counsel, legal counsel in the room and said, this is what happened, this is what we heard, what are you going to do? And he looked at us like, well, what do you mean, what am I going to do? This is a, this is a security, and this is a cyber, right, IT. Like, that's not my problem. I'm like, yes, it is. And so that was a really good way to get them to think about 
the so what for them. Because if they don't know the so what or the why of what they have to do, when an incident occurs, they'll keep looking to other people to run it. And I think, uh, to your point, um, uh, Francesca, the first thing we always do is you get everybody in a, in a war room type situation and allocate those roles and responsibilities. And it could be different every time. You know, it's not always the same people in the same roles. Jody, how about for, you know, at, at, at Target, do you have an acting out, you know, part of your program? And how, how do you organize that time? We do. I, I love how Kylie talked about it, about doing the tabletops before you write the plans, because that's a similar approach to what we took to evolve our program. We, we have multiple layers of continued training and testing. So yes, we do the tabletops for those unknowns, um, similar to what Kylie talked about. It's those situations where, like, when digital skimming was evolving about 18 months ago or so, that had to be a tabletop situation so that we could talk through where are we at to protect from digital skimming? What will this look like for the enterprise to respond? Once you have the framework, that's where we elevate it up and turn the heat up a bit on everybody and we do the war game layered exercise. That's the exercise where you make it feel extremely real for everybody. Everybody stays in character. You do tweets. We do um, media. So we'll actually play something that looks like it's from like CNBC and it's highlighting our incident and everybody falls into character. Um, so much so, just like a little sidebar kind of funny story from one of those. Um, a couple of years ago, we were doing a war game for our leadership team. So think CEO and his direct reports. Again, it was a situation where you crank the heat up. We've got tweets going out about Target. We're playing CNBC news briefings. We are mocking FBI calls. We've got the press calling our CEO, asking for statements. And in one of those instances, we pulled the, L the leadership team into the war room for a briefing while all of this is going on. And the chief marketing officer was maybe one or two weeks in role. Um, and he's so engaged. I'm so impressed with the questions he's asking, how engaged he is, how he's thinking about how he's going to change marketing for the guest. And um, he walks out of the room when the briefing is done, and he looks over at my boss, the CISO, and he's like, gosh, what a first week. And <laughs> my boss thought at the time, well, gosh, he must just really like our war game. This is great. We come to find out later he had no idea it was a game. He sat in there that whole time, eyes wide, thinking that, oh my gosh, in my first week, I'm sitting as chief marketing officer, head of comms and public relations, and I've got a large severity incident on my hands. So I think doing all of those levels is really important to build the muscle memory so that everybody steps into the room and they know what they need to do um, based on the situation. And there's secondary benefits. I mean, if you're a target and you've you lived the crisis, now you've got engagement, right? But sometimes the point, uh, they, I think, of the tabletops can be simply to drive engagements. Mm -hmm. I know uh, mm -hmm. we've done it with large organizations, and you know, you, you're like, okay, we're going to get the CEO in the room, and the reason you're here is because we've we're modeling something where you're going to be in front of Congress. Like that will happen. It won't be someone other than you, right? It'll be the president of Marriott or whatever that, that's going to have to you know go in. And so, you know, you get to a certain point in the scenario where they're like, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. It's terrible. Okay, apocalypse, you know, has has happened. But that coming together around a crisis, I, I have often said it's like in the, in the early days, maybe five or eight years ago when we were, you know, doing serious things like nation state theft of critical IP or, you know, something really not familiar to, to those um, uh, boardrooms. It was like kind of a dysfunctional Thanksgiving dinner trying to scramble a command structure in a team where you had people way over firing outside, you know, internal audits, like we're gonna interview all the witnesses and you're like, no, I don't think you should. And other people that think you have to liaise with law enforcement. And so a lot is, a lot of maturity is, 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 ha is happening over the, you know, um, you know over the, the, the years. So um, let's see, anything else in, in my, you know, in the, in the readiness, you know, bucket about, um, I think single source of truth and how do you, you know, how do you just make sure that you have the, the things in advance so that you um, literally just like the documents are moving, right? Like that, how do people know how to take that single source of truth and, and populate it out into the different audiences where information either has to be or, or you need to share it? Um, I, I want to say one other thing just about um, tabletop exercises uh, and, and staying current. So Jody was talking about digital skimming and yeah, how yeah. They, they, they ran exercises on that. Um, I think every company could probably benefit from a phishing 
tabletop exercise and a uh, ransomware tabletop exercise. And you get some Especially, really, yeah. you get some really interesting conversation uh, on on the ransomware topic. Uh, you know, on, on on phishing, absolutely. You know, when does uh, a, a credential compromise? lead to uh, a data breach that then needs to be reported and, and what sort of analysis goes into that because someone says, oh, you know, um, my email account was compromised uh, and we and we had a business email compromised and, and money went out the door. Well, it's not just about the wire that you sent. It's actually about what was in your email um, and, and do you treat your email as an online file cabinet? And, you know, what sort of um, in information and data was living in there? Uh, and, or what uh, were the capabilities of the malware? Did it have right. the ability to, to read or access or view? Right, and, and, and in New York, I guess with the SHIELD Act, yeah. now it doesn't matter if they yeah. actually got yeah. anything, just that they accessed it. But in other states, uh, or at least prior to the SHIELD Act, uh, that would have been a sort of a complicated analysis and, and you know, do your logs show exactly what was done um, and how does that factor in? So uh, I think, you know, around phishing, uh, really interesting conversation around ransomware, you know, what is the, the uh, company's perspective on whether or not it's willing to pay a ransom and at what point can you test uh, uh, someone's, uh, you know, uh, morals. And do you have a Bitcoin account? Yeah. Uh, and well, how do you procure it, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, yeah. there there are companies um, that uh, will negotiate um, your uh, ransom, uh, will procure the Bitcoin, uh, and will help decrypt uh, your uh, your network. Um, and uh, you know, there's a there's a couple of them out there, and maybe it l makes sense to have them on retainer. Um, you know, even if your corporate posture is that you won't pay the ransom and that you're restore from backup, right? Um, I think what some people are finding is that they're not as resilient um, as they think they are, uh, and uh, it's easier and less expensive to just pay the ransom. And I th I think drawing on the um, prior the lunch panel um, with SEC disclosure, you know when you're sort of in the a hot crisis and ransomware has kind of crippled certain critical business operations and the IT team is, is telling you they don't have a ready path to recovery, to recover normal operations within what time frame and now customers are starting and you know, it just, I think ransomware poses some of the hardest SEC disclosure type questions. You can often um, ex explain how um, this particular data set or what happened or what you know is you know may or may not be the kind of thing you need to tell shareholders about but ransomware mm -hmm. can be and, and another thing about ransomware is it's testing you know security everybody in this room knows confidentiality integrity and availability it's testing availability and it's like a whole different thing for executives to get their mind around that it's not about whether someone has it it's about whether you can do your own you know uh, business so um, but you were uh, asking about, uh, you know, other points about readiness. Yeah. Um, so want to make sure that we got back to your question. Uh, it was, uh, you know, but the paperwork, oh, it was about right? how, how do you get the comms, you know, how do you yeah. prepare to get the comms right? Like, I think um, so that you're not in, when we get to immediate response, you have sort of defined roles and responsibilities of I'm going to access single source of truth and go to, in the comms area or the customer service or HR or thinking mm -hmm. about all the different, um, you know, you have internal confidence, regulatory confidence, who, who you know, how do you plan that in advance, you know, yeah. so that the, you know, the comms runs? Is it like a sequence of steps that legal has declared yeah, and then there's, this, there's or how do you there's think? There's templates and checklists, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and they're part of the plan and you drill them and then, you know, to, to Francesca's point, you need plan B if it doesn't work out. Uh, but part of the plan should be at which stage do you do this action versus act this action, who's involved in this discussion. And, you know, I really like the idea um, of the, you know, you, you put your checklist or whatever it is on your wall mm -hmm. in the war room yeah. and you just, you literally work through it. I mean, if, if you guys have not read the checklist manifesto, um, it's great. It's great for every aspect of your life, um, but but it's 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 back to the simple. You know, it distills down things. These are the things. When when do we check in with our regulators? When do we check in with our customers? Who's taking those actions? I mean, it's all just on a checklist for everybody to see. It's much easier to track that. And then the templates for the predefined, you know, uh, content for for communications, maybe editable, but ideally. As, as simple and pre-approved as possible so you can just get it out quickly. 
Uh, so shifting to immediate response, I wanted to tee up something that um, Kylie brought up ahead of time, which is corporate culture and mm -hmm. what is the role of corporate culture and how you, um, you know, govern, decide, function, you know, win the crisis, lose the crisis, or, or whatever. So in some of your experiences, when you've been dealing with an immediate response of what is a threatened crisis or you know, remains a crisis. Mm. Um, how do you adapt to corporate culture? Because you could be looking at expectations of how you're going to handle something, and then there's just sort of like small p political culture and big c corporate culture of like what your workforce uh, is that. So, we for all those start yeah. with you. Kyle. Yeah, so, so, you know, Japanese organizations very focused on, um, uh, you know, collaborative decision making, but very strong hierarchical accountability. And so in any scenario, there's this, you know, endless conversations where everybody decides together, but the most senior person has to be the face of that decision. So in a crisis mode, that absolutely doesn't work um, because the guy that's supposed to be making the, the public statements or making the decisions doesn't know anything. He's got the authority, but none of the knowledge or the, the expertise. The people with the expertise aren't really authorized to make those statements. And so back to the, the do instead of plan, we discovered that in um, actually a real crisis where the plan said that these people had to do certain things and they couldn't do it. And nobody else was brave enough to step up and say, well, I can't be the voice of the company because I'm not authorized. And uh, it was a real challenge. Um, and so I think understanding, <laughs> well, to, to be honest, it was a real disaster. Um, we, we, you know, the, the person, the only person who was uh, able to say anything was only authorized to say no comment, which we all know in the face of an actual incident is about the worst thing that you can say. It's, it's like a public admission of, I really don't have a clue what's going on, so I'm just not going to say anything because it's... I don't know what's happening. It's a terrible, terrible position to take. Um, when, you, If you have an opportunity to, to uh, own your narrative, you should do so, and saying no comment really doesn't do that. But, um, you know, through doing these tabletops, we've had to overcome this idea and say, you know, at some point, anybody, whoever's available at that time, may have to say something. And so we have, back to the, you know, the pre-approved templates and so on, um, but when you're building a plan, if it doesn't take into account your culture, you know, the, the flip side is also true in organizations where you've got people who are like, well, I can say anything. I'm, I'm authorized, I'm a senior guy, I can get up in front of the TV and say whatever I like, right? That's also just as dangerous. And so making sure that your uh, response plan and media interactions take into account the, I almost want to call it the personality of your company, almost. And, it's really a really far more important than you, you know, think. and it's the person at the back of the parade talking to the regulators or the you know private litigants. The, the documented plan exists. It's adopted. You turn it. You show it to everyone. People rely on the fact you represent that you have it. So if it's something you cut and paste or bought and put it on the shelf, you're still going to have somebody in a hot seat at a deposition, figuratively speaking, one day, accountable to like. But it says you should do that. You're saying you, so. You're saying you have a plan, but you shouldn't do the plan. So you could depose yeah, somebody for trouble. ten hours yeah. on a plan. Yeah. So I think what I liked about what Jody was saying is like the the, the plan is totally relevant, right? It's mm -hmm. totally congruent, but mm -hmm. it's because it was done from this organic process that was like we can be true to this plan, and that's a state of maturity. I don't I don't know. I don't see it that often, honestly. <laughs> and to add to that thought process about what you just mentioned, I think some of the control assessments and risk assessment exercises are really the key, right? Like that kind of drives the culture. Like organizations are not just doing these assessments just for the sake of doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Like some of these things kind of show what sort of control maturity there exists, right? Because mm -hmm. having a plan, you are basically demonstrating that I have so-and-so control objective. So and so I meet so-and-so control objective. So having a continuous exercise like as part of like SOC assessments or SOC 1 assessments, SOC 2 assessments, organizations do like a quarterly or biannual, these kind of control assessments and risk assessment checks. So some of these things help in, in those aspects as well. 
I actually think uh, another way to complement making sure you have the most effective plan besides the controls assessment or the risk-based approach is making sure you're investing in the threat-based approach. So making sure you're building up your cyber threat intelligence program mm -hmm. to a very robust state. That is going to serve as an extremely solid foundation for your overarching security program, and it's going to serve as a really strong foundation for an effective crisis program. If you don't have a robust intel team that doesn't understand at a granular level what the threat actors are capable of that are focused on organizations like yours, Forget your crisis plan. Right. Like it's, you've got to understand what they're doing, what they're after, and how do you build your program around it? And then how do you build your crisis program around that so that you know how to play that game of cat and mouse with those threat actors? So that you understand when they're pivoting the types of ransomware and why they're doing ransomware. When they're moving away from POS malware because more organizations are doing point-to-point -point encryption and they're moving to digital skimming. How do you protect against that? How are you ready to respond? So I think, I think one of the most important pieces for effective crisis response is effective cyber intel. And if you can bookend your security program with those two things, I think you'll have a really, really strong program overall. That's, um, sorry, just to yeah. chime in, um, threat intelligence is usually uh, the point where some people who you know might have like a mental hurdle, um, might their eyes might gloss over and I think it's, like you said, critically important. Um, how, how do you uh, at, at target, um, and I'm sorry to like <laughs> jump in with a question, but I'm really interested. Um, how do you uh, get people to understand what intelligence you're sharing? So we take a lot of different layered approach to getting the cyber threat intel that we learn out to the right people in the organization. So earlier I talked about making sure you just have the right people for crisis response, so those cross-functional teams. We don't just activate those cross-functional teams for tabletops, war games, and events and incidents. We actually do regular threat briefings with those cross-functional teams. So our comms rep, that's part of incident response for crisis, she knows at a level of detail she never thought she would, digital skimming. She knows ransomware at a level of detail and the different variants of ransomware more than she ever thought that she should. Um, and so we, we spend a lot of time looking at that group as an extension of our security team. We don't just do that for our cross-functional crisis teams. We do that more broadly for the enterprise. So my Intel team hosts uh, monthly cyber Intel briefings for all of IT. And then we do deeper dives for what we call our Security Ninja program. And so that's about 150 so engineers across IT. And we go super deep with them. And then we'll go even deeper for their specific areas. The flip side of that is, as all of us up here, this is why we're all here, right? We, this is not a target problem, this is an industry problem. So not only do we invest in sharing that intel internally, we're super, super passionate about sharing that intelligence externally. So a lot with the retail and hospitality ISAC, with the FS ISAC, and then um, beyond that, it's picking up the phone. We see something that Walmart needs to know, we call Walmart, they do the same for us. And, Amazon or you know pick whoever that partner is um, and I th I think the the organization understands it at a deeper level now Does that help? and can I just add one thing to just the the flip side of that is making sure that your cyber teams know the business right back to always back to this so what what is what does this mean to the business so um, you know I've had interestingly more success with the cyber people getting them to understand it than IT guys. A lot of IT guys are just like, oh, I'm doing my thing, and there's an incident, and they're like, okay, well, it doesn't bother me, right? So it's so essential that they understand the business impact in whatever organization you're in of their particular piece of technology and the threat. So the two together give you the whole picture. Yeah, completely. And just to add to that point, a lot of technology teams these days in organizations, what they're doing is, so from an IT team perspective, IT folks are very used to code reviews, having code reviews done before something moves to production and things like that. A lot of organizations are now integrating security reviews as part of their SDLC cycle. And that's really the key because it ties everything together yeah. from what you see in the threat analysis and tying it together to the security code review. So that's a very important thing that organizations should consider. Yeah, and I, you know, maybe that's a good segue to, um, so you know, we've managed the crisis, we've done this, and, and 
Um, we, we're, we're recovering normal operations. You know, things are trending. We've gotten through um, you know, the, the crisis. What are the, la the, this is like my favorite thing. Like, what are the last steps? Like, how do you complete a crisis? Like, it's so when, when people are no longer frothing and running out and so, you know, excited about, um, you know, they're in the middle of a game and the ball's being kicked all over the place, how do you maintain the discipline to re re learn and recover, which is, as I work with regulators, they totally get and expect, because this is really engineering, that you're going to have to do an after action. You're going to have to do a lessons learned and say, this happened, what was the root cause, and what am I going to mitigate? So maybe if anyone wants to jump in and speak to how do you maintain organizational discipline across the functions to learn and improve after you sort of come through um, the, the, the sweatiest parts of the event. Um, sure, so uh, an incident could be treated just like a tabletop if you get into that cadence of exactly as you've just described. What happened, how did it happen, what is the true root cause, not the superficial root cause? How do we fix it? What do we need to fix it? And then you track it until it's fixed. And at the end of all that, you go back and update your plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, and but you can, happen, you can practice that. that. You can you practice think that's real world. Yeah. So you practice that in the same way that you you practice your tabletops, right? So you know we've had our fair share. Um, I think most people here understand what that looks like. Um, but it, it's it's essential. You know, it's like. Uh, any other piece of the environment, if, it, if there's a piece of it that's broken, whether it's a server that's failing or, you know, could be anything. I mean, you, you have to fix it. It's, 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 not, it's not actually difficult to, get, to convince people that they've got to fix these problems because they don't want to live through this scenario again, again yeah. right? So I, I think you know, coming from law, I think sometimes lawyers think like, well, if we resolve the matter, we resolve the issue. Hmm. And the, the hybrid nature of um, these kinds of corporate crises and events is that you will be second guessed on your, the maturity of your engineering. Hmm. So it could be rolling out new code. The, the, the regulators are super smart now about, hmm. if somebody was here from the MTC, super smart about what's strong application security and what's, hmm. you know, and, and what's not. And so I just wonder if, like, there's, like, if you, if you don't have a mature organization, you need somebody to have ownership of, like, no, we're not, like, writing damning documents that would be turning over to a plaintiff. What we're doing is completing a process that's the core of what we'll be judged on is whether we understand right. that security comes from closing off incidents and, you know, learning and going forward. Mm -hmm. Anyone is that? Yeah, and I think to that point, like post-incidence response post-mortem is something that I've seen very common in like financial organizations, mm -hmm. and not just for cyber, but across the board, right, mm -hmm. for, for any sort of incident, and cyber is also a part of that. So that really plays a key role, because as part of those post-mortems, like in all the organizations, incidents are kind of prior, like have a priority level, like typically like P0 to P4 kind of thing. And then in those post-mortems, like everybody is kind of on the table from a senior management perspective, analyzing based on the plan what went well, what did not went well, and how, how the action items can be in integrated to enhance the plan further. Post-mortem uh, incident analysis, uh, I would also like to add that in some organizations which are mature enough, this kind of incident analysis also happens not just for incidents that your own organization have, has faced, but what if something like that that happened at X organization could happen at ours? Like Are we Target, prepared for, for example. That? Yeah. <laughs> I know what yeah, companies use that. Yeah, right. We thank Jody for yes, such a rich you. fact there. <laughs> so that, that also helps. Yeah. Jody or Francesca? You know, I actually think you both covered it really well. Um, the post-mortem, after action, whichever way you want to label it, it just has to be part of your process. When I talked about that one pager we put up in the war room, that's actually the last phase. And it's got a checklist just like all the other phases. And so everybody's come to understand that we'll be creating issues, we'll be tracking it. And um, to Kylie's point, you don't get the argument because they don't want to live through it again. They don't want to be yeah. called to the war room another time. Yeah. Great way to get budget. One last thing that I'll mention is, uh, and you, you actually just hit on that point, is uh, taking advantage of a crisis, um, it, getting budget, getting resources, getting extra tools. Um, so that is really uh, Im important, you know, being, being agile and, and taking advantage of those things, um, which probably sounds bad, but 
maybe be opportunistic is a better way of phrasing it. Uh, but uh, also, someone has to own all of those action items, right? Mm -hmm. and, and at an organization and, and uh, with a team that is, uh, you know, coming from different disciplines, uh, everyone should be walking away with a clear understanding of what their piece is. Um, and there should be at least one person that is responsible for making sure that those pieces get done, uh, that they get tracked, remediated, and, and ultimately concluded and documented. Mm -hmm. There's also um, a sort of a follow-up education piece. Um, so I used to run uh, just regular uh, BCP and DR. Um, my job title was actually Global Crisis Manager, which is my favorite job title today, but in any <laughs> case. Um, and uh, when you have a technology outage, or if you are doing regular business con continuity and disaster recovery planning from a technology point of view, you can almost kind of finish it. Right? You, you, know, you know what the business is doing, you know how the system operates, you know how to put in high availability, availability systems and recovery processes, you can automate a bunch of it, and you kind of know how to do that. So I've spent a lot of time educating our senior management about the difference between technology recovery and recovery from a cyber incident and the fact that it never ends. The threats evolve every day, their, their target expands as your business changes. You know, the, the, the implications for cyber are actually quite different in terms of this ongoing process than regular DR and BCP. And so, you know, in the, in the early days, it's like, well, we're done now, right? And it's like, no, it never ends. And so educating them about this continuous process, and I think Jody's point about the, um, you know, these, these threat intelligence briefings really help sell that idea. It never ends. And so once yeah. they get that. I think that's so wise. And mm -hmm. I, um, I think that the, the, the news media like to co cover an eruption, you know, mm -hmm. and an event. And so there's something in our general vernacular where we think, here's this big crisis, and then it's gone. And so it's in the news, and then it's not in the news. But to me, a really rich and interesting story is the story of the resilience of business mm -hmm. to, re to withstand perpetual, you know, like these threats mm -hmm. that are just sort of a daily reality, like an undercurrent of a threat that's mm -hmm. never going to go away, mm -hmm. or even a very major incident. And so maybe you could start with Jody and say, okay, you're practically six years out to the day from the big event of everybody who thinks you like the target breach. Do you want to comment on kind of your experience of what that means six years out? Does it make you a stronger company? It makes you a wiser? What, what do you think? I, I think with any crisis, it's, it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity for transformation. And the transformation can happen well beyond the, the actual catalyst of the crisis, if, we, if you will. And I think for Target, I'm going to use the caveat of these are my own words right yeah. now. <laughs> But for Target, I actually believe that the breach was a catalyst um, that helped transform the whole organization in such a positive way. Uh, yes, the, the organization came together was, as one very strong team to lead through the transformation that had to happen in the security organization post that breach. But there were so many other transformations that were inspired out of that security transformation as well. We transformed stores, we transformed online, we transformed our leadership team. I mean, at, at, there was nothing that, that went um, untouched post that catalyst of transformation. Uh, and I think, again, every crisis, big or small, you need to look for what are the opportunities, not just with the catalyst world, but beyond that. And I think Target did that really well. Anybody else? Stories of resilience. <laughs> I would just like to add to what Kylie mentioned about like education and raising awareness. I think that is really the key, especially when it comes to cyber cyber crisis, cyber crisis management. Uh, because uh, like I feel business, post, especially post the 9/11 era, is very uh, very knowledgeable and understands the whole business recovery, uh, business continuity, yeah. disaster recovery, and things like that. But when it comes to cyber attacks, like some of the basic principles that apply in terms of BCP and DR don't really apply. For example, like if you're, if you, okay, if you have data backups, but what if your data backups are also corrupted as part of the cyber attack? 
So these are like some of the things for raising awareness. And that's where, again, the whole control landscape comes into picture. Uh, that's why organizations need to raise awareness of why like user entitlements and things like that are important. Because if an attack happens, how we can ensure that the, the landscape is as minimal as possible. And so I, education I, is the key. Yeah, I know you're um, passionate about continuous controls monitoring. And tell me, what do you mean by that? Like, what's automated? What's technical? What's, what's human? What, you know? Yeah, so by continuous controls monitoring, what I mean is kind of assessing how your controls are performing on a, on, on a continuous day-to-day -day basis. Like a lot of risk assessments or control assessments that we see are like kind of a point in time or for a period of time kind of exercise. These days, if you see a lot of financial institutions as well as technology institutions are investing more and more in continuous controls monitoring where like on a on a daily basis or pretty much on a real time basis you know if, if my control is performing and if so what the what what my control performance percentage looks like and that's important because many times organizations when they get into trouble especially with regulators and things like that it's not because they did not have the controls but many times it's the case where they had the control but the control was either not effective or was not performing at all so that's where the whole automation piece kind of, kind of come into picture. So in like simple terms to explain as an example, like from a, from a user entitlements perspective, a lot of companies have controls of, let's say, a lever control. So when somebody leaves, the access will get removed in, let's say, 24 hours or whatever the time frame of the control definition is. Do, from a continuous controls monitoring perspective, organizations can take one step further and say, okay, what does my control performance look like? What is really my lever performance when it comes to demonstrating that performance? And this, this kind of CCM, continuous controls monitoring, is taking a lot of momentum in actually external audit space because if a uh, lot of audits that happen right now, uh, that happen even today for, let's say, SOX audit, SOC 1 audit, or any other certifications, for a period of time, but they are mostly sample-based testing because of lack of autom automation. Organizations who are investing more and more in continuous controls monitoring can actually demonstrate their full population, that here is what my control performance looks like for, for, for my full population of that is in scope. So a lot to come on there is what yeah. I foresee. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's definitely the future, right? And, yes. and when you see it happening in the largest organizations, it's only a matter of time before it becomes standard of care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. from very large to large to, you know, to medium or in particular sectors. And um, I think another uh, theme you all want to always say is if you want to be a service provider up into that financial services chain or critical infrastructure or certain things, these kinds of um, expectations will get to you sooner rather than, mm. than later. Yeah, and if I can tie that back to uh, resilience, I think there's another aspect of resilience that's emerging that is extremely important, and that is the, the fact, back to the whole, um, you know, the, the DRBCP type of thing, the continuity of your business is no longer only relevant to you. Right? The, the world has evolved into, a, a, particularly in finance, but actually in almost every industry now, very few um, companies operate independently. We have this fully hyper-connected structure of financial services and technology services and cloud services and relationships with each other and B2B relationships and customers that rely on the technology to do business. And that's, that's you know, very, very pronounced in finance, but actually across the board. And so your, when we talk about resilience, it no longer applies just to you. It's what is your role in the overall ecosystem where you live, whether it's finance, whatever it is. And so this idea of everybody's controls have to be at a certain level. Everybody has to be able to communicate effectively with their business partners when there are um, crises or incidents that might affect them. And so the, the, the problem is really elevating out of just how do you manage your own environment, how do you make sure that you have good controls that are effective, how do you make sure you have good communications with your partners so that the whole uh, industry remains resilient, not just um, the individual. And that's where the regulators are going. You know, they, they, they aren't looking um, 
only at the, the programs in each individual company. They want to know how you're interacting with your critical third parties. What do your third parties' partners look like? How are you monitoring them? And so, you know, that, that's really sort of changing the, the landscape. Of I know in our, you know, significant part for our expertise is to um, support the movement of capital, right? Like whether a company is going to be able to access public markets, are they going to be eligible for an M&A, is it going to impact the price, or looking at, at that diligence, and I don't see any domain where a company of any size, from the smallest startup to the, you know, the largest, you know, types of, you know, I don't know, just bring down of your diligence because you're going to do a debt offering or something, that these, these issues percolate through all of that. So it starts with regulations, it may start with liability or, I don't know, reputational damage, but I felt like now it's really percolating, you know, throughout, uh, you know, business mm -hmm. and in a way that it's become a top, th I think data security, just to speak really broadly, mm -hmm. has become pretty top three from mm -hmm. almost any plan. I don't know if anyone has a comment on that or just sort of how do you think about your ecosystem of your, your vendors and your partners and, and the others you have to share data with. For uh, financial services as a uh, regulated entity uh, required by the DFS, you know, we have to push our requirements to third parties, and we, we had been doing that for some time, so it wasn't, it, it was like a natural uh, thing. Uh, but I think that sort of forces everyone up to a certain level. In some ways, it makes the conversation with our third parties easier. Like, we have to do this with you because we're required to do it by law. Um, and uh, some of them, of course, are required to do it as well. Um, I, having said that, uh, you know, we have seen uh, more assessments, um, you know, coming from insureds or coming from uh, our third parties. And, and uh, you know, we're sort of uh, debating, okay, you know, what is the best way of approaching these now that we're on the receiving end of them? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no current uh, standard. I know that uh, a lot of people are, uh, you know, hopeful, but, you know, would I accept a standard questionnaire over my own right now? No. Maybe 10 years from now I will just out of necessity. Mm -hmm because there's too many of them floating around. I, I think a significant legal trend is that in five or ten domains, you will have to, to document that you have reasonable security measures to pick the most generic phrasing of it. I can. California's data breach law or, you know, whatever, that this is the thing, thing someone's going to say, put it in the data room, I want to see, smell, taste it. Mm -hmm. And the days where you could say, do I have an information security program written down? Yes. And an IR plan? Yes and then you're done are, mm -hmm. are, I think, you know, pretty obsolete, right? Yep. I think there aren't very many settings. And so I wonder if, you know, professionally you think, you know, if you, you know, like how do we demonstrate, there's this questionnaire interrogation approach that does seem to be the most um, common, but how do you think about what body of information you can quickly turn over? Is it, does it make you lean more toward third party assessment or summary assessments or things that you can turn over where you need to um, prove to someone that you have reasonable security. So I really like the idea of the uh, exchanges. You know, a lot of uh, um, financial um, companies have got together and said, let's build a, a separate standalone exchange based on a set of standard questions and, and assessments and continuous monitoring of some kind. And we will do an assessment of every body and it's available here so you can subscribe. So if you want to go and see what the status is of any particular company, you subscribe to that platform to get that information, which sort of separates the, the submitter from the requester. You know, and, and we are both in, in, in this case. We have people come to see us and we like to go and see them. And so to put that broker in the middle with, with a standardized approach. Now, the biggest challenge is even, even though we have these uh, consortiums of large financial institutions getting together to do that, there are several of them. So instead of them all getting together and saying, we'll come up with one, you know, different groups of them got together and, and uh, you know, in Europe as well. And so we still don't have any standards. So I, I do think that ultimately um, that, that sort of idea almost like a credit bureau, if you like, right. for cyber health of institutions, it's probably the most efficient way of doing it. What, what do you guys think? I, I do like the simplicity of that approach for those that get assessed. Mm. But for an organization that does a lot of assessing, I'll bring it back to the intel or the threat-focused view. I don't need to know all of the policy controls of specific vendors based on what they do for us, but I do want to focus in on 
what are they likely to be targeted for? So years ago, we weren't looking at our distribution vendors if they didn't have a direct connection to us, they didn't have any sensitive information. But any of our supply chain or distribution vendors now with ransomware are critical for our security program to look at because they could have a significant impact to operations if they're hit by ransomware. And so I'm gonna look at them differently than I'm gonna look at another vendor that might be supporting call centers. And so if they're both answering the same questionnaire, am I really gonna be more confident that they're taking the right measures for the threat actors that are targeting them? Um, and so that's one thing that I think we lose is, is we look at just a common framework that makes me a little bit nervous as, a, as the one doing the assessing, as much as I love the simplicity of it. Um, I do think it is nice to complement those frameworks with um, some of the ongoing monitoring tools that are out there now, like a bit site, for example, mm -hmm. where you can see like the, the score of the risk score of the vendors. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do that over my program, right. but it can be a nice compliment because you can monitor and a trigger will go off that could trigger you to then go in and look at that vendor a little bit differently or a little bit more deeply. So it kind of complements your assessments with some sort of ongoing monitoring at least. I, I see so many you know, questionnaires in you know, data rooms and other, other things and find, I mean, you could take PCI as an example, right? So to be, to, to, to get their um, you know, payment card industry security certification, if they're not a level one merchant, they're a smaller merchant, they're gonna fill out these self-assessment questionnaires. It's like one of my favorite things that I could find why they're not eligible for the one they filled out or that their answers are just, you talk to them for 10 minutes and their answers don't work. So how, how Jody, do you get beyond, behind the questionnaires at all? Because a questionnaire is something that you can hold up and say, I did not do anything, I did not ask, but then if I always find with insurance, with security, like your objective is actually security. It's not just to have checked the box. So how do, you, how do you look behind the questionnaire? So just like anything else, we all have to take a risk-based approach in order to scale. So for us, it does get back to understanding those critical vendors, either from a risk standpoint, from a security risk standpoint, because they have such sensitive data or connections to sensitive systems, or an operations criticality where we're considered, where we're concerned about things like ransomware. Um, those that are highest risk have to go beyond a questionnaire. And so again, that's where the partnership with Intel comes in. That's where the Intel team works very closely with the vendor security team to, to talk with them about this is what we're concerned about from a threat actor standpoint. And let's have that conversation with the vendor about how are they approaching that? How are they prepared to defend themselves against that? And then if something does happen, how do they work with us to respond to the crisis? And then it gets into how is our data segmented and you go a le level deep deeper with those than just a standard assessment. And so that's so time consuming what you said, right? That's a, that's a team. That's where the risk-based approach comes Great. in and the right level <laughs> yeah, of investment in security. Yeah. And we're fortunate to have, to have both. Um, the other aspect there, of course, is contracts. Yeah. So, you know, the, the problem with the questionnaires is their assertions, people can misrepresent or, or willfully misunderstand or whatever it is. And so you have to put it in the contract as well that if these things happen, that they're accountable for that. So yeah. a combination of those yeah. and then the... Which is totally third best, right? Oh, yeah. Like the, oh, yeah. there are, I, right. I see so little B2B, I think insurance pays, self-insurance, mm -hmm. insurance, and then maybe some B2B, but you don't see like a huge ton of arbitrations and things mm -hmm. of like people trying to really, you know, shift. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, the expense, but I, I think but that's the confounding thing. Like you have to have the contract, you yeah, have to so, have that. So what yeah. we found useful is having it in the contract helps us get better responses to the questionnaires. Right. They take it a little bit it. more seriously yeah, I see what you're saying. if it's backed by some, right. some language there. Right. Yep. One last thing on contracts is, um, you know, we have had uh, some of our vendors, and thankfully it hasn't resulted in uh, anything, uh, you know, serious, but they have had incidents. And, and when we find out about those, then we, you know, send them a, 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 you know, a letter or some sort of correspondence pointing out that we have this agreement, that they're under certain obligations. Uh, and if uh, they didn't provide us notice uh, within the period required pursuant to the agreement, we point that out so that we don't later have an issue, uh, you know, uh, not being able to enforce it because we were silent. Um, you know, to, to date we've gotten some, you know, good response. Um, and and uh, again, you know, not being out, you know, any any dollars uh, thus far, uh, we've been okay. But 
you know, I can see a situation where someone has those requirements in the contract, doesn't exercise them, uh, and, and then puts them in a bad position, uh, you know, from a liability perspective. And I would just consider complementing the letter with a phone call as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. I mean, the very first thing you do when you find out one of your vendors has been compromised, whether it's from your Intel team or from notification, is to get on their the phone with their security team just to understand that it is isolated. It's not impacting your organization. Um, that's the that that's helped us tremendously to just okay, how worried should we or should we not be at this stage? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to circle back to um, re rehearsal and process during a crisis, that's a big time suck, right? Who's going to be the one to hold all the hands and be the communicator, you know, an authorized communicator to have live conversations, not just like, oh, here's our three paragraph bulletin, you know, to, up to update you. I think it takes, um, a, you know, a, a lot of resource, that, you know, to be able to manage communications, you know, live and thinking about single source of truth and mm -hmm. who went off the thing. Um, I, I, we, we're just about at the end. I don't know if there's any questions from, from anybody for um, this great panel. Go ahead. So thank you all so much for your time. Um, it's been a great panel. I've really enjoyed it. So when we were talking about resiliency, and resiliency is, like you all mentioned, is about being able to be adaptable um, and responding efficiently to threats. So automation within security um, environments can be used to make processes faster, more efficient, things like that. Um, but automation can also pose a lot of risk within security environments. Um, so with that in mind, do you see automation replacing security response teams in the future? Or do you think there will always be a synergy between um, human-led response teams and automation? I can I can chime in on that. I think like I don't foresee automation completely replacing your security incident response teams or things like that, right? Like I feel there will always be a human interface available and it should be available based on all the things that we spoke about. But automation will really help in uh, taking away the noise because the amount of security incidents that get or even incidents that get raised and get raised to the security level is like so humongous these days that automation and machine learning will help to reduce that noise piece. So always going to be, you know, human plus machine. Uh, but I actually think that the value in automation is the speed of response particularly with something like ransomware, which can happen so quickly, if you've got the right triggers in place with some automation to shut that down. Um, and again, back to education and communication, making the business understand that it's okay. This was quite a, quite a hard sell, actually. It's okay for the machines to decide. Um, there was a lot of resistance to that, emotional resistance to that, but, uh, you know, back to how do you manage the risk? What is the greater risk that you might inadvertently shut down a, a business process uh, or that you might get owned by ransomware? And, and making sure that you know where and when those decisions are, are the right ones to make and, and programming. And I think automation uh, in the future is absolutely essential. I don't think we can do it. Maybe more defensible. Yeah, I don't think we can do it without automation. Uh, to Jennifer's point earlier, uh, a lot of incident response is time consuming, right? So um, my perspective would be uh, automation helps you focus on the things that you actually need a human for um, and uh, allows you to sort of segment uh, what the responsibilities are going to be. Anybody else? Hi, uh, my name is Roxana. I work at a multinational media and entertainment company. Um, but I've worked at both small and very large companies, and both on the physical and cybersecurity side. And the one thing that I've noticed equally across all of these companies is that the employees think that you know it hasn't happened to me. It's not going to happen to me, um, and you know it's not going to be enough to have a risk management strategy in place if you don't have employees engaged in cybersecurity or physical security. How do you get employees to be engaged and not see compliance training or drills or things like that to be a hindrance rather, you know, how do you get them engaged um, on a higher level? We do a couple of things. So it depends on the role, but for the enterprise, when you're thinking of I've got 
you know, this 25-year-old merchant sitting at their desk at headquarters, how do you engage them in cybersecurity? Or this, you know, 30-year-old clothing designer, how do I get them excited about it? Um, for us, it's about making it really fun and splashy, um, representative of the target brand. So we do, um, for the enterprise, we really lean into October Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I'm sure everybody here is like nodding. Yes, we all do that. Um, but we really lean into it. Like we have escape rooms that team members come to that we build that's all about uh, solving these security challenges and they have to work their way through it as a team. And we saw, I mean, the sign up was full in like the first couple of hours that we rolled that out for October Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And you've got these, these clothing designers coming in and learning about security and trying to break all of these different puzzles so that they're smarter about it. And throughout it, they're getting learnings about how to identify phishing emails because for that role, that's the biggest risk they pose for us. And then at the level of like IT or for our engineers, it's a totally different thing where it's all of the time. We're always doing, like I said, the cyber briefings. We'll do weird, th weird things where we'll host um, Star Wars for our IT team, but before they come to Star Wars, we'll talk about all the security flaws that happened throughout the movie, and then they'll have to watch and identify like, oh my gosh, they did not have multi-factor authentication on that, or, and like we'll have them play and find out if they can identify all the security flaws and we'll have a competition on it. We do secure code warrior challenges. Um, so we gamify it, we make it fun, and we try to meet every level of the organization where they're at in their way. I what, would say even, oh sorry. No, I, I was just gonna say one thing that we did during uh, Cyber Security Awareness Month, um, which we've done now, I, I think like five years in a row, um, but now we're doing it in the month of October. But uh, one thing that we did this year uh, that we thought was successful in, in gamifying it is, you know, every year we've done these like sort of like privacy and information security professor hours, right? Where we ask people to sign up and we go in, in you know, a large break room at our offices and we make ourselves available to answer questions. And it doesn't necessarily have to be questions about the company. It could be questions about what you're seeing in the news. Um, it could be, you know, questions about, you know, uh, how do I do this or uh, or that? Um, and this year we um, had a uh, a training uh, exercise that was a game, um, uh, and we set up laptops in the break rooms, and we had people. It, it had had actually a Danger Zone that song um, playing in the background, uh, and and people needed to you know answer questions to successfully beat the hacker to the open machine. Um, and it re people really got into it um, and uh, were sort of egging each other on and uh, you know the uh, and I think that made it uh, a lot of fun uh, for people and if they beat the hacker to the machine they got a swag bag of you know uh, different little tchotchkes and, and and it's amazing what kind of a turnout you get for either food or, <laughs> or giveaways. I love free um, I, I probably have to close I was just gonna say yeah. two similar things one is on fishing which is a perennial thing and everyone else like so You've got to mature beyond we do phishing training, yes or no, this binary view. There are phishing, anti-phishing programs out there which will, you will score at 22% on day one and you'll score at 90% at the end. So the regulators, people are aware of this. Like it's not impossible to score the 90, 95%. So it's not that, of course, someone could still always click on something, but there are solutions out there that are more like this that are incredibly effective. So that's one thing on phishing is that it's not do you do phishing training. The homegrown ones are always terrible. I had one client, they did a homegrown one, and the IRS called the general counsel and said, could you please take our phone number, our actual phone number, out of your phishing exercise? We're getting all these oh phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the uh, just a, a, a law firm um, example, like in our October, so we have m m mostly high, highly compensated professionals that you're really worried about, and what is what are they going to? They're probably not going to go to a break room, and they're not going to get you there. So you have to. The point is to be role based. So what you say that our population really respects is our clients, that the, our lawyers, that we have ethical obligations to them. You could do a webinar with boring slides about that, but it didn't work. So what they did this year was they went out to our like Goldman Sachs, you know, like top banks that everyone knows are our bread and butter of our clients that are, you know, some of them, you know, just really very, very, very large accounts. That's where your friends work, those are your clients. And those CISOs were sitting there talking in a really natural way about why they depended upon our law firm 
to be secure. And so it was kind of compelling and interesting to see who was going to come up and the points they made were really important points. But the, the one teaching point they wanted out of it is this isn't just like you know, your employer telling you process. This is really critical to our business. And, you know, so anyway, so I think we probably ought to wrap up. I think we're be behind, beyond our time. So. Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, yeah. and wonderful panelists. Yeah. There's a great discussion and, and the end of really a, a very compelling day. So I just, um, Thank I you. want to thank you for your time. I know you're all incredibly busy. And a thank you to you, dear audience, for, for engaging with us. Um, I think some quick key takeaways that you know, substantively we, we learned and reviewed today that, that cybersecurity really remains at the fore in terms of critical issues facing our nation's economy, our national security. And I, as much as there is a lot to be scared about, I feel very happy and emboldened by the amazing women that spoke with us today to show that there really are incredibly talented, fabulous people doing this critically important work. And I also feel like we covered a lot of good best practices and, and inform information that we were able to obtain to, to take home to our organizations and, and in our practices. And, and then just the message also that came out of today that there's still a lot more work to be done. The statistics are not where they are. Maybe we've gone from, from an F to a, a D minus in engaging, uh, reaching a, a gender equality in, in the field, but there's so much opportunity. And these kinds of things, bringing together the women leaders and, and women who are interested in the field to learn that there, there are more of us. We just need to, to take the effort to find each other and to keep finding each other through programs such as this. And for making that possible, I, I thank NYU Center for Cybersecurity. Um, we are very grateful to the Hewlett Foundation for their support and to Craig Newman um, Philanthropies for his support and uh, Craig Newmark Philanthropies for his support. And also a huge shout out and thank you. You've seen them throughout the day and, and throughout the, the planning process, but Sarvanaz Bakhtiar and Alex Pot Potkaravu, it would not be possible without uh, you making the engines run. So thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Um, Till next year. Thank you.